Uh, here we are outside the church and most of the grave, you know, gravestones around the church are sort of Victorian sort of 1800s. The, the little ones, if you see little ones, very often they're 1700s, but they didn't used to do such big, uh, big tombstones. There's a little one behind you there, two prins, and the prins uh, were here in the 1700s and they left their name in Prince's Farm at Down Thomas. And um, then we have the uh, John Callard, who was a clerk to the church, and Elisha Gullett here in the front, and he's got a nice inscription saying, remember me as you pass by. And um, Elisha Gullett uh, lived in the mill, he was the miller, and um, in 1824 there was a huge uh, storm and two big ships were washed up on the rocks and poor Elisha Gullett lost his ducks and his chickens and um, luckily he kept a diary so he told us all about it and um, the mill was nearly washed out the went, sea went through the roof and washed the millstones down and um, he had three strong sons and they're responsible for building the walls if you walk out, uh, out this way out towards the Warren there's some nice stone walls along there and um, beside the, the two clerks there are the Drakes and uh, the Colmans are just up there and the Drakes were related to the Colmans. John Coleman came here to be the blacksmith and married Margaret Simmons who was uh, in the forge and needing a, needing a blacksmith I guess and um, he came from Ermington, big family of Colmans blacksmiths in Ermington and um, he brought his niece with him and his niece uh, married the Drake so and the Drakes came from um, Newton Ferrers, two brothers, one was a groom and one was a manservant and um, they came and settled in Wembley, brought their, their wives, well they had their wives here and lots of children so there was a load of Drakes and Colmans around at one time and there was still the two Miss Drakes when I was young but now sadly uh, no more left. They did have two sons and one was William and one was Francis Drake but both died when they were young so uh, no little Drakes to carry on. Um, we're going to proceed around the church and this here is to Hannah Attrell and that's the other Attrell grave. The Attrells were big farmers at West Wembley Farm in the square uh, where the dog grooming place is, we call that the square and West Wembley Farm was there and they farmed all the land from there down to the beach and um, there was no houses, there was just Knighton and Down Thomas uh, street villages and there was no houses sort of between West Wembley and, and, uh, and here. So, um, so that was the Atrals and they were quite big farmers in their day. Um, so they've got nice heads and that one was redone by the family came back from America and it was in a bad state. So they redid that one quite recently. So we're going to proceed around there, um, around the corner, and see some more. And he came here to be gamekeeper in the times of James Hook. And James Hook came from Crediton and he brought some of his family with him and, and Mr. Can was a cousin, I think. And years ago, there were, you could see in the back of Langdon London Court in the windowsill there was James Can scratched in the in the windowsill. Um, this is Mr Knott here, he was a farmer at um, Knighton Farm. Nice headstone, the, the slate headstones are nice to read and they do last longer than the, uh, the sandstone ones tend to co be corrupted by the weather. Um, his family came back from to see me once from Oregon so they spread all over the world from Wembley. Um, in the corner we have Joseph um, Sayabi, Jeremiah Sayabi and um, he, was a, he was a South African that came over in the in the war in the um, First World War, is that right? So it dates on it. Yeah, First World War, they came over to uh, dig the trenches and whatnot from South Africa and we tried to find a bit about his history in South Africa um, 
but uh, they were sort of given Christian names, so he probably wasn't um, wasn't uh, christened Jeremiah, or you know, he, he probably might have been christened Jeremiah, but it wasn't his birth name. Uh, and Say Abbey, they believe, may be the place where he came from. Um, so difficult to track them down. Anyway, they were stationed here um, for a while over at um, Rennie Lentley, um, which was an army camp. And he walked off the cliff one night and they found him at the bottom of the cliff. So that was what happened to him. I wouldn't know. How a job to say after all this time. He might have been looking for the loo, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, another nice, lovely uh, carved headstone here for Thomas Matthews and his wife Martha. They were the farmers at Manor Farm at Down Thomas and sadly they both died in the cholera epidemic of 1832 and they died within three days of each other. It's quite sad. Are, are they, is that the original headstone? Yeah. It is? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, that's a nice one isn't it? Yeah. Um, while we're here we can see the, the headstone here that's split down the middle to William Cornish and Josias Blake here and there's another one over there too, um, a chap called Wood Greeny. And they were on the breakwater pinnace, which t turned up um, and lost uh, 19 men. Uh, they used to go out to work on the breakwater when they were building it. And they'd stay out there all week and then come back at weekends. And they were coming back Saturday afternoon, I guess, or something. And people were on the hoe and they watched this uh, pinnace come in and tip up in the rough weather and they were all drowned and um, there was I think six six or seven Wembry men but we've got three gravestones here um, they had a big collection in Plymouth for the families and they gave them a big bible a great big bible like this and um, Josias Blake was the ancestor of uh, the last blacksmith in Wembry who was called John Simmons Blake Coleman and they still had the Bible uh, as a family Bible and had all the family written in it. And um, that was where it came from when Josias lost his life. And um, it's still, a, it's, it's, we put it in the, um, we had it when they sold the smithy and um, it's in the record office in Plymouth. Yeah. The last uh, descendant, Mrs. Kitto, was the niece of the last John Coleman. She didn't have any children of her own, but she was very fond of her pets. So in the back of the Bible is all when the pets died, the budgerigar and the cats and the... <laughs> Quite interesting. Yeah. Now move on a bit further round. And then you can just see Elias Tolchard here, which is disintegrating rapidly. He was the wheelwright in Down Thomas. Um, him and his wife were there quite a while, real work for about 20 or 30 years, I think. <laughs> Mr. Bunker here, he's got a nice uh, epitaph, all about physicians were in vain and didn't do much to ease me from my pain. But it's hard to read now, that one. That's the John Woodman Green Greeny there, he was the other who with 19 others um, lost their lives, drowned when the breakwater, uh, breakwater pinnace tipped up. Um, where are we now? We'll come over this side a bit. If you can look in the back there, there's a nice one the little one there. Where is he? Oh, he's around the corner. Look. John Horn. It's a slate one. That one's disintegrated. Um, he was working on the breakwater. So a lot of Wembley men worked on the breakwater as masons and what have you. And he lost his life and it says died of a melancholy hurt. And you wonder what that is like. This would be uh, yeah, joke yeah. something on his head, I should imagine. Yeah. So, um, so like all the people in Wembley, they, 
years ago they'd all have their own little bit of ground and then the enclosures came in and they all got pushed off and then they all had to be farm labourers. So when anything like quarrying or the breakwater came in they all took jobs doing things like that. So and it was quite, you know, dangerous some of the things. What's the average lifespan of a, a Wembley person? Some of these were older too folk, obviously a lot of these were, but... Yeah, well a lot of the men seem to die, you know, in their 40s and 50s. Um, apart from the gentleman over there, he lived to be 102. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he wasn't, he was just ordinary chap. Uh, but all the family were long livers, you know, it's two or three generations, they all lived to be 99 and 102 and what have you. Um, yeah, John Horne is there and he died of a melancholy heart and then his nephew is um, over there and I think it was his grandson. Um, he was working when they were building the forts on Staden Heights and they put in a railway to move the stone and he slipped when he was there in the, and his leg went underneath the tramway and the railway, the rail, you know, the thing of stone went over his leg. And the poor chap died within a couple of days. He was only a lad. So it was dangerous times. <laughs> um, just in there is the Rogers family. Um, the Rogers is still here. Uh, John Rogers sits at uh, Staden Heights. And John, his son Johnny keeps some sheep around a few places. Anyway, um, William Rogers was the teamster at uh, Wembley Barton and they, there was a nice picture done um, August Gold, I don't know if any of you have seen this one before um, and the teamster is the man with the whip <laughs> driving the horses and the field is just, be just behind the churchyard over there behind the churchyard there is a little steep field and they were cutting it with the and um, Maud Clay was a artists. Her father was Dr. Clay in Wembley House and she painted that and it was a huge painting and you can see it in Tor Abbey and it fills up like the whole wall as you go in the hallway in Tor Abbey. Yes, I've seen that it's a lovely picture. Tor Abbey? Tor Abbey's at Torquay. Oh. They're just creating because they're going to shut the golf course in front or something. Oh, right. so, um, so I'm thinking that um, William Rogers over there is the chap with the whip driving the horses because he was the teamster. And um, and sadly, um, he also he also when he was young he laid the foundation stone to the down Thomas um, Methodist Church. But then when he was 44, he was paring a hedge, and the scythe went in his leg, and he got gangrene and didn't last very long. So he died age 44. So his family had to survive on hard times without him. We had a poor house in Wembury. There was one where the school is and down Ford Road. That was a poor house. And um, I think probably where the church room was. I don't know. Somewhere along there. The almshouses, isn't it? Are they different? Then? The almshouses. Poor houses and almshouses. Yeah, similar, similar sort of thing. Yeah, almshouses. Yeah. But there was a dedicated poor house. And then there's another one over at Langdon where the lodge is. Langdon Lodge. Yeah that's thatched was three or four cottages and they've all been joined together and one of those was a poor house for over that side but uh, once they did the, the union um, Plimpton Union everybody went to the workhouse at Plimpton which is became Plimpton Hospital didn't it because um, they couldn't cope so you had to pay everybody who farmed land paid a penny or a tuppence and then it went up to in the shillings because they had to keep the poor pay for their own poor in each parish yeah. and um, and then it got several parishes like Yampton with people coming through all the time they couldn't manage it so then they did the workhouses in the 1800s so we move around a bit further William Beer can you see him he's leaning back like that and he was the last man to farm at the mill and he was there for a long long time and um, he farmed, farmed the mill and all the fields around here and we've got pictures with like hay ricks. All the ground around here would have been eaten down by sheep. It wouldn't be all scrub like it is now. And there's below the church there's a couple of, a couple of hay ricks. And then they had the barns um, where the marine centre is. And there was a cottage on the end of there as well. 
and they used to I've got pictures of them with these fields here being potato fields where the horses are and it was all tilled and um, earlier than that the, the little piece down the beach that goes out I've got a picture of that as a garden with rows of vegetables in so uh, it was all, everything was tilled and used in years ago now it's all gone back to fuzz right in the corner over there is um, Rosemary Bannerford and her family um, Rosemary used to lay out the dead if somebody died in the village you'd call for Rosemary and they used to call them the first and last because they'd deliver the babies and uh, lay out the dead and there was usually one lady in the village who, who did that and it was usually passed down through the families so Rosemary followed on from her grandmother who used to do it. Nurse, the Coleman, or nurse come back and do that as well. One of the Coleman's was a nurse, yeah. Yeah, she came back and laid the dead out as well, I thought. Was Probably, it? yeah, she, she, she may have done, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but Rosemary was like the last of the line. Yeah. Right, we'll move around a bit. This is the resting place of uh, two of the Miss Corey, Miss Comedies. And um, the Comedies were at Langdon from 1500 and 1555 or something like that until 1876 and uh, they had ups and downs people came and went and anyway um, the family came back and they, everything was going wonderful and um, Charles Biggs comedy was increasing the estate to most of the parish and um, then he had a son he had four or five daughters and a son and um, the son didn't do what he was supposed to do and he was all he was interested in was hunting and he got short of money in 1876 so he sold the estate and um, his sisters who were in Langdon Court had to move out so they moved to um, uh, Knighton Villa which is now called Four Corners in the middle of Knighton and that was like a farmhouse it was once a Wilson slaughterhouse and farm and um, they did up the house, turned it into Knighton Villa with a drive down the back from the top road and um, and they lived there um, uh, one of them was Gertrude, she was very into helping the poor and she died quite young in her 40s in that bad winter of uh, 1896 or 1893 was it? 1896 I think really bad winter um, so that left uh, Laura and her sister and um, Laura was, there's lots of letters that she wrote because things weren't being done the way they were done in the comedy's time because Mr. Corey moved in and took over Langdon, the new, new, new groom and of course things weren't done as they had been so she was a bit put out. Are these the original uh, Yes, looking a bit sad, it's all looking sad isn't it? Yeah. So, so before the um, whatever it was called when we changed from being Roman Catholic, what's the word? Reformation. Reformation. Before the Reformation, of course, we were all Catholic. Church was Catholic. Hence the sundial to tell you when Mass was going to be. And the entrance to the church came down this way. Um, Wembury was run by the um, Prior of Plimpton, Plimpton Priory and um, they had a place where the monks could stay over at Wembury because they owned Wembury Farm, uh, Wembury Manor and they came to the church down this way and, and if you above the old or the churchyard across the way there there's a track but it's all grown in you can't see it it's all so the track would have come in from Cliff Road and they would have come over the top because I expect all the ways down the road would all have been a bit boggy. So they came over the top, they came down the top, down in here. So this is the entrance to the church really, and this, this is South Porch, which is really the, the main entrance. And the, we go in and out the North Door, which is not how it used to be. So, is it a Catholic church? It was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, was this a cliff or a grave down here? Sorry? Here, is that another step to the cliff? I don't know. I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. There, there is comedy tombs underneath the altar, and there is uh, out in that wall there. 
there is a way of coming in under because there is a there used to be a little pig's house there in the wall and it had a doorway into the underneath so so it may have come in and gone right in through i don't know but i've not uh, <laughs> i don't i don't know i've never been here when they've opened it yeah so um along comes mr corey 1876 and he made his money with coal moving coal from south wales to london and he had ships and what have you made a lot of money came settled in wembury at langdon and his wife died and he remarried uh, the daughter of the vicar of Plimstock, who was a bit of a socialite she had two or three sisters and they were all socialites in um, in Plymouth and she was very friendly with the Duke of Edinburgh brother to Edward VII who was the uh, Admiral of the fleet so he was in Plymouth a lot and um, Mr Corey was an old man by that time and then she had two children which belonged to the um, Duke of Edinburgh and um, they were all debutantes and brought up she moved from when her husband died uh, her stepson took over Langdon so she had to move so she had to, they had a big fall out because she wanted the uh, flagpole and he wanted the flagpole and so forth anyway she moved to Thorn and she lived down there and she married the, her bodyguard Colonel Gore and um, she had these two daughters that had to be presented at court and um, she built the um, a ballroom and a billiard room hole out on the flat bit out of, in the front of Thorn. And she's got the two daughters married off to uh, soldiers. And one became um, in charge of Stormont in Northern Ireland. And the other one was in charge of Windsor Castle. So they did quite well. His son, um, William uh, Richard, Richard Wallace Corey, and he married and had two children and sadly his son who was only 22 went in the army and he died of a fever at maker barracks when he was only 22 so that was the son and heir gone so um he was supposed to have had the biggest funeral ever known in wembury and they all marched out with the soldiers in the bands from plymouth when was that, again? When was that? uh in about 1920 odd and then the estate was sold in 1927 um, um, after the after the father died and um, there was just one daughter left and she still owned Bay Cottage when I was young and that was her little bolt hole but um, then they all moved away and the whole estate was sold up and lots of people were able to buy their own cottages and were about 90 pounds and so forth and um, that's the, that was the end of the feudal system in Wembury. Probably, yeah, just to use in the name, I expect. Didn't the king come to London Court at some stage? Social as a social thing. Oh, yes, they had shooting parties. The, the yeah. most important person in the village was the uh, gamekeeper. And he had to say what everybody did on their tenant farms because they had to preserve the, the game and the pheasants for when all these important bods came. And... Uh, yeah, Edward the Seventh is supposed to have come and stayed with Lily Langtree and at Langdon. And um, there's a picture of him. There is a picture. Yeah, Somebody that's a picture. The end is the Prance family, and they've got a tomb there. And Courtney Connell came here in 1725 and bought the Manor of Down Thomas, which included Manor Farm, and they held it until uh, 1924, I think. So they had it all that time. And I guess they didn't need the money because they were all solicitors and doctors, weren't they? The Prats family. And they were important in the start of Green Bank Hospital up Green Bank. And um, Ear, Nose and Throat was the, was, uh, what he did, the last one. And um, the last one uh, became a vicar, I think, and I went to school with him. So, so he's not in there yet, but he will be one day, I expect. Um, so that's the Prances. So we'll move up the steps and there's a couple of nice ones here to um, servants of Mr. Carmody. So it's 42 years a servant to Mr. Carmody.
James Seaward, that's another servant to, yeah, another servant to Mr. Comedy. Just there is the Reverend Burgess. He was uh, the vicar here for 40 years. And he lived in the, um, he came here to be the vicar. And before him we had um, the Reverend Lane from Brixton. And he had to come over on his horse, hence the Sunday school come stable little room was where he put his horse at the front. Uh, and he was the vicar for about 50 years. And, um, and he came from Brixton and then we had the Reverend Burgess and he wanted to live in Bay Cottage, but for some reason uh, it was in a bit of a bad state and he didn't get, he didn't get to live in Bay Cottage. He had to live in the, uh, what became the old vicarage over by Wembley House. That's called, uh, is it called the old vicarage? It may be. It's had several names over the years. Um, his wife died and one of the Miss Coleman's, Nora, came to be his um, carer and um, housekeeper. And she said he used to go to sleep and he had a big beard and the cat used to go to sleep on his beard. So, uh, who have we got here? Anybody important? Nathaniel Willing, yeah, he was a farmer in Knighton. And then up here we have lots of Averys. And the Avery's a good, uh, a good family, uh, Wembley family name. And Francis Avery, um, he was the one that was had up for smuggling and he got caught going up through Tavistock Road in Plymouth with three ponies and uh, so many gallons of rum and Geneva and um, something else. I can't think of the other one, he had spirits. Anyway, he was taken before the justice and he was with two other Wembley chaps and all they got was their horses and all their goods confiscated and they seem to have been let off and then you wonder well where did all the gin go and the justice was uh, uh, Edmund Lockyer who was a brother to Thomas Lockyer who built Wembley House and they were mayors of Plymouth um, different members of the family nine times there was a Lockyer mayor of, of Plymouth so, uh, and I was in touch with one of his descendants for, well, I'm going to say 35 years at least, because I remember she sent a, a koala bear when my little girl was born, and now she's uh, 36. So, so we've been in contact a long time, and sadly she's just passed away in her 90s. Here's Nathaniel Avery here, and he lived in the house in Down Thomas at the end, where there's a row of um, Down Thomas cottages, and the end one is Nathaniel's house, and he was a mason and built walls and things. And um, I've got a friend, John Avery, and he's done all the Avery family tree and what have you. And he believes, I don't know if it's right or not, but he believes Nathaniel was on the ship when William of Orange landed at Brixham. And um, he came here and he married uh, Elizabeth Collins and she was a um, spinster lady with a, with a tenement and a cottage. And of course a cottage and a bit of land was a boon in those days if you had nothing. <laughs> like one of my ancestors, he married, he married a widow in Stadiscombe. Uh, she was 10 years older, but uh, she had a cottage. So that's quite a, quite a bonus. Anyway, he came and he started the Avery family and he, he came with his either son or his nephew, but we, as we can't find Francis Avery born, we don't know whether it was his son or his nephew, probably his son, because every generation after that had a Francis and a Nathaniel. And I've got a cousin who's an Avery and she's called Celia Francis, actually. They all put Francis in. Perhaps they wanted to be associated with a smuggler, I don't know. Uh, and the big chest tombs over here belong to the Hook family. And James Hook came here in 1720. And um, he said to his nephew, it's wonderful down in Wembry, come down here from Crediton. So he came down and he stayed here, lived to be 92 and built Gabba Farm. 
and lived for quite a long time in the back of Langdon Court and he took over all the land in Langdon and Dan Thomas and farmed it all with his family. Uh, so then they rise up in status and then they have chest tombs and the son, one of the sons became a surgeon and he's got his plaque inside the church and he calls himself Dulla Hook. So they went up in the, up in the world. Um, over there is the, you can see the, um, that's the last of the comedies. That's the gentleman I was telling you about that didn't do as he was supposed to. Um, Vincent Pollex van Carmody with the canopy over the top. And there should be um, bronze Pegasus horses on each end and the, the hooves are left, but somebody's whipped the bronze horses. And they were there, you know, when I was young. And then underneath is a nice bronze coat of arms of the Carmody's with the three pairs. And he, um, for much of his life, was living uh, a menage a trois with a lady uh, and a much older husband. And then when later on, when the old boy died, he married her. But then it was too late to have any family. So, um, so there was no comedies to carry on. And he was the um, master of the Tetcot hunt. And that was what he cared about most was hunting. So he lived in a place called the Hut at Tetcot. And um, a while back I had a couple down the church here and they were looking, looking to find his tombstone because the chap lived in the hut, so it's still there. Um, so he was quite a famous chap up that way and um, when he retired as master they gave him a great big uh, silver replica of uh, horses and um, hounds running around. So. Um, so we have there, the, as I said, the hooks. And as we turn around and go along the top, all these along here, are, most of them are to do with the Wilsons and the Antonys. And the Antonys, like the hooks, came here. He, they came here from Ermington. And he gradually took over all the land this side of the parish. He farmed at um, Wembley Barton and he rented train and then when, um, when the Lockyers came in 1802, they wanted him out of the farm because it was all in front of the house. The farm at Wembry Barton was right in front of Wembry House. Um, and that was all knocked down. And he moved to train and he built my house. And um, so we've got some nice stone barns and what have you. And I think probably he took some of the stone with him from Wembry, uh, Wembry Manor. So um, we'll work along the top, round the corner. Wilson, they said, used to say it was Anthony, Anthony um, beloved wife of James Curry Wilson. And they were first cousins and they decided to get married when they were a bit older. And they lived at Train Farm and that was, uh, and they adopted two of, um, two of James Curry's um, nephews, oh no, nieces. Yeah. Mr. Anthony's grandson that inherited train was called Philip Light Anthony. And this is the grave to Philip Light Anthony Wilson. Um, his sister married the Wilson in Down Thomas. And this little lad was 15 and he was helping with the hay harvest at train. And he tripped over a metal fork or, or hay prong or something and it went in his head and sadly he died so that's why he's got a nice tombstone but his railings are disintegrating. John Wilson, Mary Eliza Wilson. Yeah, she was the Anthony, Mary Eliza. I used to know her granddaughter. She was called Mary Eliza. Uh, this is Robert Warren Anthony. Now he was the son that you thought would have inherited, but he didn't. He, he, he missed him out and he went to uh, 
Philip Light Anthony, his grandson, Rob, uh, Robert's grandson. And he died day day to at train. Um, I think there was uh, something in the family like um, diabetes or something like that, because he was supposed to have gone a bit loopy. And the old people in Wembley used to tell me they were afraid to go up train road because it was all grown in and they used to say old mad Robert Anthony will get you if you go up there. Right. No, that was the old tales. Yeah. So, um, so we we'll move on a bit and there's a few more. Who are these? Oh, the Sansoms. Yeah, one of the Wilsons married a Sansom and the Sansom was the gamekeeper and um, he lived at Mount Pleasant at the top of Ford Road and there used to be a big tower there in the days of Josiah's comedy he built a tower and a lookout there that's why it's called Mount Pleasant and they knocked the tower down and built the little farm and that was the kennels for the shooting for you know when the Prince of Wales was here and all that and Mr Sanson was the head gamekeeper and he was out shooting um, shooting rooks with Ned Wilson and Ned Wilson's gun went off and, and shot Mr. Sansom's arm off. So Mr. Sansom always had a hook. And um, a few years ago when, when Langdon Court was a pub and people would go in there from the chalets and what have you, uh, you could just walk in any time. And somebody came in white as a sheet and they said they'd seen somebody in the woods, an apparition with a, a man with a hook. So. So whether Mr. Sansom is still walking in the woods, I don't know. That's just what I heard. <laughs> oh, that's the Taylors at, um, that's the Taylors from Taylors Farm at Down Thomas. And it's, it's sandstone in the lane flat and it disintegrates. And this one, uh, this is Mr. Willis, who was captain of the Biddyford that got washed up in 1824 in the terrible storm and um, the ship was on the rocks and it was being washed over by the sea and James Craig came around from the Coast Guard from the Coast Guard cottages in the Yelm and he was watching the ship and he could see something moving on the ship and he swam out and he rescued uh, Captain Willis's wife and he captain had strapped her to the mast and she was being washed over by the waves and all that. And anyway, he rescued her and brought her ashore all over all those rocks and that. Yeah, strapped her to the mast to save her life. No, to save her life. Otherwise she would have been washed overboard. And uh, James Craig was one of the earliest um, Coast Guards to ever get a commendation and a medal and so forth. So he's quite famous for what he did. Yes, a brave chap. Um, this here is the Tessery brothers. They've got a bit of a story. Two twins came to live in Wembury and um, they came from Newfoundland. And the people in Newfoundland who had fisheries and what have you used to send their children over here to be educated. And there was a link between sort of Newton Abbott and, and Newfoundland at the time. Anyway, the Tessery brothers came here and they didn't want to go back over there because they didn't like the winters. So they became um, paying guests for Martha Sherwell in Knighton Farm. And Martha Sherwell's next door. And when they died, and one of them was a good pianist, so he used to pay for all the village things. Um, when they died, they left a share in their business in Newfoundland to Martha Sherwell. So what was she going to do with that? I don't know. <laughs> anyway. The family over there paid her out, so she did get something. So that was uh, that was a little bit about that. Because a lot of the farmers' wives all did paying guests. They still do, don't they? Against me. That one in the corner is uh, is the grave of Courtney Connell that I came, said came here in 1797 and um, 1765, I think it was, and bought uh, the manor of Down Thomas from the Charlwich family. Um, I haven't been able to find out what he did. He must have done something in Plymouth to make money. He must have had money to invest. So he probably was a merchant or something. Yeah. 
Daniel and Marina Kane. Um, Kane's are still here, of course, and um, they're descended from the Hook family and the Antonys. And um, my two little grandsons, their great granny was a Kane, so they're descended from them as well. Anyway, Daniel, they didn't have any family, Daniel and Marina, but they lived in Spiral Farm. And Daniel was very good with his pen. And he wrote a lot of records and he did all the farming records and the trusteeships for anybody who died and everything. And it was all in a big chest up at Totnes. And the eldest son of the Kane family of that branch had this chest. And I went up there and he let me look in the chest. And anyway, I picked out all the things to do with Train Farm and um, copied them off because there was a Kane that died. Silas died at Train. So we had a list of everything that was sold in his sale. And it was all quite interesting. So I copied all that. And then sadly, when he, the old boy died up there, um, nobody seems to know, either they're not telling me or they've chucked it, but then what happened to all the records that he had, I don't know. Um, gone somewhere. So that's what Cain died, is it? Uh, yeah, same family, yeah, we had cousins really, just couple well, second cousins. Yeah. Were these graves spelled? Those, uh, those are to the Mogridge family, some of them, yeah, Mogridge family. You can't read them anymore. Um, yeah, they owned, um, sorry? Yeah, Martins, I think. Some of them are Martins. It's a Martins charity. And um, they were connected with Plimpton. And the Mogridge's tenement was Laundry Cottage, what has been. Oh, right. You know, Longridge, yeah, no, that used to be called Mogridge's. Oh, okay. Yeah. I read recently that Sailors have been buried here. They're in the graves of. Wrecked sailors, perhaps? Oh, lots of them. They always say all buried in the churchyard, yeah. but where? Could yeah. be anywhere, couldn't it? No marks. Yeah. Mr. Um, Norcott, is it suffered long but murmured little? Oh, that was good then. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, that's Mr. Dawson there, and he came to Wembley House. He was a ship owner from Liverpool. Came to uh, came to live in Wembley House, was there quite a while and built Watergate Cottages, which used to be called Dawson's Cottages. And uh, that orchard belonged to the Coleman family, and because the Coleman's owned land and they didn't want to sell it. But he said, if you don't sell me the orchard, I will take all my custom away from you. And as he was <laughs> the local squire, they had let him have it. So then uh, Watergate Cottages were built, but they didn't have a lot of land with them, you know, and it, it was all bucket and chuck it over the back into the marsh. And then they said there was an epidemic of something and they said oh, it was the train farm marsh behind the cottages was causing all the epidemic. But I doubt it. Um, this is James Law's Lockyer. He's the last of the Lockyers to be buried here. And he was down at Thorn and they, they, sold, um, they sold Wembley House, kept the estate when they came here in 1802 and uh, Edmund Lockyer uh, started built Wembley House, rebuilt it. That was the third house that's there now that Edmund Lockyer built. And sadly in 1806, he was coming home from Plymouth and he was thrown out of his carriage and broke his leg, got gangrene. There was supposed to be a cow underneath the hedge in the lane and the horse frightened the cow. The cow got up quick, startled the horse threw him out of his carriage and he was there quite a while before anybody found him. And um, they took him to Radford, I think, to the Mr. Um, Mr. Harris that was there and he looked after him, but he died. So then the house was barely finished. So um, his wife, Mrs. Um, Lockyer, stayed on at the house till 1825. Then they sold it. And James Laws Lockyer was down at Thorn living and he didn't like what the new new man did, Mr. Barwell, blocked up the gateway at the top of uh, Passage Lane, built a wall, and he was seen by moonlight on top of the wall, top, knocking it down. So, uh, lots of little niggles that went on years ago. Um, then the Lockyer's uh, died out and it was all sold off, you know, separate, but um, they were the last ones to own the sort of Wembley estate in its entirety. Here we have Dr. Clay. Dr. Clay came to live in Wembley House in the 19, uh, early 1900s. 
and he was a, he used to like you know keeping fit and that and he'd walk to Plymouth sometimes and um, he took on these four servant girls who were one of them was my cousin's grandmother and they all became servants in the big house at various times married local people and um, Dr. Clay had three daughters and two of them uh, um, when he died had farms and one went to live at Coombe Farm at Coombstock and she was the artist that did that nice painting and the other one lived at a farm called Fancy which is up at Roborough I think it's where the park and ride is now I think it's been knocked down and the third daughter she had been married and she'd come back there and she was milking a cow this is a story comes back from Australia she was milking a cow and a young man comes up from Thorn and he was down there helping Mr. Arkwright write a book. Mr. Arkwright that came down there used to write books about um, uh, pointer dogs. He was into pointer dogs and Jersey cows. And um, this chap was helping him write a book. And he came up, met this uh, lady. She was, you know, over 40. And they got married. He was only 32 or something. They got married and produced a son. And then I think they split up, but um, the, the son had two children and one of them ended up in Australia. And the descendant came back to see me one time and told me all these tales and showed me lots of pictures he had of, uh, of his great aunt's paintings. So um, we've pretty much done full circle. Uh, that's another drake there, we've done the drakes. So I think we'll leave it there. If uh, and you've got any questions, yeah, thank you very much. Your memory is amazing. Yeah. <laughs>